Hello and welcome to this video tutorial on the history of management. Management is about people. History is about people. The history of management is about people. So in this lecture, I'll discuss the evolution of management as it moves from one prominent person to another. Let's get started. Max Weber, a German sociologist, first proposed the idea of bureaucratic organizations. It is pronounced Weber with a V sound, Max Weber. The aim of a bureaucracy, according to Max Weber, is to achieve the goals of an organization in the most efficient way possible. A bureaucracy should be efficient. Now, previous to Weber, promotions in organizations were based on who you knew, as in monarchies and patriarchies, not on what you did well. Weber elucidated the key characteristics of the bureaucracy as a pure form of an egalitarian meritocracy. First, there is a definite hierarchy. If you've ever looked at an organizational chart, you can see who reports to whom from the bottom to the top. In order for a hierarchy to perform well, there needs to be a clear division of work duties. Each person has a specific job or role to perform. Of course, along with those specific roles come specific duties. Janitors clean the workplace, accountants count the beans, assembly line workers make the widgets, etc., etc. In order for a bureaucracy to work, there must be specific work procedures. There is a procedure for submitting your expenses for reimbursement. There is a procedure on how to approach the customer in a new car dealership. There is a procedure for completing that dreaded TPS report. Because the bureaucracy is essentially egalitarian and anti-favoritism, the relationships between the workers and the levels of workers must be strictly impersonal. Some workers work at a company for 20 years and some for 20 days. Growing too fond of a co-worker can stymie the bureaucracy. In order to find the best workers, there must be a selection process for new hires. The days of the boss's nephew getting the job instead of someone truly skilled and with experience are over at most firms. The selection process involves a series of employment tests, ranging from completing the job application to conducting a work sample to an interview and lots of other points. Each of these tests must be scored and the best applicant with the highest overall score should be hired. Because selection is based on merit, promotions must also be based on merit. In many ways, the bureaucracy is anti-favoritism and pro-merit. If someone is promoted on something other than merit, the organization and its members and its customers can suffer. All of this doesn't sound so bad, does it? Without the concept of the bureaucracy, we might still be in hunter-gatherer societies struggling just to find food. However, we have progressed way further than that, and much of our progress is due to bureaucracy and Max Weber's development of its key characteristics. Let's move on. Henri Fayol, French guy, Henri Fayol lived from 1841 to 1925 and was a French industrialist, mining engineer, and management theorist, who is often referred to as one of the pioneers of modern management theory. He is best known for developing the 14 principles of management, which provide a framework for effective organizational management. Fayol's work laid the foundation for many of the fundamental principles of management that are still relevant today. These principles provide a foundational framework for effective management practices, focusing on areas such as organizational structure, communication, motivation, and employee relations. While some aspects of Fayol's principles have evolved with changing management theories, many of his ideas continue to influence modern management practices. He believed that management could and should be taught to others, that is, taught in colleges and universities. So thank him for being here today. These ideas shaped companies from the boards of directors on down. From his 14 principles, he developed a list of five basic management functions, which are 
planning, organizing, controlling, commanding, and coordinating. So his P-O-C-C-C is equivalent to the modern day P-O-L-C. By collapsing the last two C's in his list into the modern day function of leadership. Planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. Let's move on. Frederick Winslow Taylor, such a regal sounding name. Frederick Winslow Taylor is the father of scientific management, which is the thorough studying and testing of different work methods to identify the best, most efficient way to complete a job. The basic principles of scientific management are, one, there is one best way to do every job. Two, scientific selection of personnel should be used to uncover worker limitations and to give required training. If the job is carrying bricks, it could be found out that a person had to be able to lift X number of pounds to do the job. Well, then a test was given to the applicant to do that job. There must be financial incentives for performance. Perhaps the job paid two cents a brick or some such. Those who performed slowly earned less and those who performed the job more quickly earned more. This is called the piece rate system of compensation. Piece rate. The rate of pay is tied to the pieces of production. Functional foremanship should be used by specialized experts for specific aspects of tasks. The worker takes orders from these specialists depending on which task was of concern. Let's move on. Lillian and Frank Gilbreth were also proponents of scientific management, but they took it another step or two further. They engaged in full-blown time and motion studies and reduced every motion and work act into units they, they called Thurbligs. They were probably not the most creative of folks because Thurblig is simply Gilbreth spelled backwards. But they were able to analyze jobs so thoroughly that not only could they scientifically measure effort and motion, but they could minimize such effort and motions to the point of the most efficiency. In fact, many scholars think of them as the world's first efficiency experts. Think about analyzing the duties of jobs so that they can be done with the most ease and the best efficiency. Think about a job unloading railroad cars full of bricks by hand, one at a time. The Gilbreths could determine that the best way to do it was to stack maybe six bricks on each other, cradle them with both hands at the waist level, turn to the left, take three steps towards the rail car, proceed down the ramp in five steps, place the bricks in a stack on the pallet, turn to the right, and take five steps back up the ramp. Repeat, repeat, repeat ad nauseum. Ugh. Their contribution to the theory of management sought to maximize efficiency and with that to maximize profits. It was a sort of dehumanizing way to look at work though. Nevertheless, their lives were so interesting that one son and one daughter of the 12 Gilbreth children co-authored a book called Cheaper by the Dozen. In 1950, it was developed into a Hollywood movie and has been remade twice since then. However, the Steve Martin movie and the Gabrielle Union versions of the movie are not at all like the book nor the original movie and bear almost no resemblance to the lives of the Gilbreths. But the first one does. Let's move on. Henry Gant. In a piece rate reward system, pay is dependent solely on production. A piece rate system pays a worker based upon how many pieces they make. If you make, say, five widgets, then you get, say, $5. If you make two widgets, then you get $2 or some such. In Henry Gant's task and bonus system, workers weren't docked pay for not achieving higher levels of production. Workers who produced more got a bonus. And everyone received a flat daily pay. So if the daily goal was 100 widgets, everyone got paid the set rate. And if you exceeded 100 widgets, then you got a bonus. All workers could get a sort of guaranteed pay and even earn a bonus. 
production doubled under this new system. Now, Gantt and Taylor were strong proponents of training and developing the workers. Gantt's approach to training was straightforward. First, scientifically investigate each aspect of the work, find the best method, and the shortest time in which the work can be done successfully. Second, find a teacher who is capable of teaching this. Third, reward both the teacher and the student when the training is successful. So he's best known for the Gantt chart, like the one on this slide, but he also made significant contributions to management with respect to pay for performance plans and the training and development of workers. Today, the use of the Gantt chart is widespread. Microsoft Project Software uses them, as do most to-do list software programs. You might use them on a, to map out a semester-long project or something. Let's move on. Roethlisberger and Mayo are best known for their roles in the Hawthorne studies at the Western Electric Company. The Hawthorne studies were a series of experiments conducted at the Western Electric plant in Chicago during the 1920s and 30s. These studies sought to understand how various factors in the workplace environment could impact employee productivity and behavior. Here are some key points about the Hawthorne studies. They started as illumination experiments simply. They initially focused on the impact of lighting on worker productivity. Contrary to expectations, the researchers found that changes in lighting had little effect on productivity. Interestingly, productivity increased regardless of whether the lighting was increased or decreased. It kept going up. This gave rise to what is now known as the Hawthorne effect, which refers to the phenomenon where individuals modify their behavior due to the awareness of being observed. In the context of the studies, productivity improved simply because workers knew they were being studied. In experimental psychology, it's called the observer effect. For example, in Stanley Milgram's studies on obedience, most people were willing to apply what they thought was a painful electric shock to another person based simply on the fact that a man in a white lab coat with a clipboard told them to do so. The presence of an observer impacted the behavior. The researchers didn't realize that social and psychological factors had a significant impact on productivity, and maybe illumination didn't. Factors such as team dynamics relationships with supervisors, and a sense of belonging influenced employee motivation and performance. The studies found that strong social relationships among workers led to improved group cohesion and increased motivation to perform well. The result of this landmark set of studies is what has now become known as the Human Relations Movement, which was a major shift in management thinking. In sum, this movement emphasized the importance of understanding and addressing the social and psychological needs of employees for improved performance. The studies highlighted the value of involving employees in decision-making processes and considering their opinions. This participatory approach was believed to boost morale and motivation. Although the Hawthorne studies provided valuable insights into the role of social factors in the workplace, they also faced criticism for potential bias in data collection and interpretation. The studies significantly influenced the development of organizational behavior and human resource management theories. They emphasized the significance of considering the human element in management practices. In summary, the Hawthorne studies were a pivotal series of experiments that revealed the complex interplay between social factors, motivation, and worker productivity in the workplace. They challenged conventional assumptions about worker behavior and prompted a shift toward understanding the psychological and social aspects of management. The key finding that was that pay was not the only thing that motivated workers. That is, people can and will get different things from their jobs, so it reinforced the key aspect of management as a human interaction endeavor. Let's move on. Mary Parker Follett 
was a social worker turned management theorist who believed that conflict could be beneficial because it's simply the appearance of differences. Rather than avoiding conflict, the differences that arise in a conflict, according to Follett, should be assessed to see if something can be changed for the better. Now we refer to good conflict as being constructive or cognitive conflict, if you will. They're all the same. Good, constructive, cognitive conflict. The undesirable form of conflict is known as emotional or dysfunctional conflict and truly should be avoided. However, Follett was the first to suggest such a thing as good conflict. She theorized that there are three ways to deal with conflict. First is domination, which is when one party deals with the conflict by satisfying their own desires and objectives at the expense of the other party's desires and objectives. This is the fabled zero-sum game in economics. For a person using domination as a conflict resolution strategy, if they win, then you must lose. We can see how that might sabotage some work relationships or other relationships, if I may. Compromise is when both parties Compromise is when both parties deal with the conflict by giving up some of what they want in order to reach agreement on a plan to reduce or settle the conflict. That makes sense. Slightly different from compromise is integrative conflict resolution. Integrative conflict resolution, which occurs when both parties deal with the conflict by indicating their preferences at the very outset and then working together to find an alternative that meets the needs of both. For example, say you like scary movies and your spouse likes comedies. You might think that there is no way to come up with an integrative resolution for movie selection. However, there actually is a whole genre of movies known as dark comedies. I would suggest that everyone see the movie Heathers, starring Winona Ryder and Christian Slater. It is very dark and weirdly funny. Let's move on. Chester Bernard was an AT&T executive whose ideas about cooperation, the executive functions that promote it, and the acceptance of authority influenced companies from their board of directors on down. His focus was on the role that executives play in the effective functioning of the organization. He defined an organization as, quote, a system of consciously coordinated activities or forces of two or more persons, unquote. That's a fairly general definition of an organization, but it is a good one. He came to realize that individuals and organizations are important to the organization because of the different characteristics and experiences that they bring to the organization. This was a bit different from the interchangeability of people into roles, as in scientific management, which saw workers as cogs in the wheel and really nothing more. His most famous contribution is his phrase, zone of indifference, which is different for everybody. There's a range of duties and requests that people will take or do without question. These ranges are different for everyone. Some ranges are low on the scale, such that the person will do just about anything without question. Some people have a high range and will question everything and cannot be convinced to do very much. These ranges not only vary from low to high, but they also vary in their width. For some people, there is a broad range of duties they will perform without questions. And for others, the range is also big, but it includes duties that they will not do. In essence, workers grant managers their authority, not the other way around. This is similar to what organizational behavior scholars call countervailing power, which is the ability to offset or fight back against the power imposed by others. Let's move on. 
Douglas McGregor was a professor at MIT with a doctorate in psychology from Harvard who focused, again, on the human side of management. He decided that managers subscribe to either Theory X or another theory I'll discuss later. According to McGregor, managers saw many employees as Theory X people who want to be directed and who need to be coerced into action. That's a fairly dim view of people when examined from any angle, but there are indeed people who need to be told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Moreover, some people actually prefer it that way. Now, that's not me and probably not you, but they do exist. In fact, none of us probably sees workers through that lens anymore. On the other hand, he decided that there were managers who saw people as theory why people who were motivated by something more than money. Those people could actually enjoy their work and didn't need the manager to crack the whip, so to speak, to get them to do things on the job. We all probably wish all workers were like that, but they are not. However, some people will enjoy any task, duty, or job, and other people will hate everything about the job, and even their own mother for making them get that stupid job at the hamburger restaurant when they were 16. But I digress. Let's move on. William Uchi is a professor at UCLA who began his research looking at the differences between Japanese and American management styles, of which there were and still are many. Now, some of these differences certainly have cultural undertones, but the basic difference is that the American style focuses on individual responsibility of the manager and of the worker. However, the Japanese style, because of cultural norms, relies more on collective decision-making because, in part, group harmony in Japan is more important than our individual duties and accolades. His theory Z was really unrelated to McGregor's theories X and Y, so that is unfortunate. Theory Z was derived from Deming's Total Quality Management Imperatives, also known as TQM. Theory Z sought to enhance the well-being of the worker, not only at work, but in their private life. Part of that well-being was derived by providing a job for life as it's common in Japan. In the last few decades, the concept of one job for all of one's life is also almost ludicrous, as people jump from job to job and even from career to career. Part of that journey is the ever-changing quest for complete life satisfaction by people, which is almost never achieved. And another part is the lack of loyalty that companies show their employees today. Let's move on. Peter Drucker was a management theorist and professor at NYU. His prolific writings on practitioner-related management topics puts him at the forefront of the focus on human relationships in business rather than on number crunching in business. If you think about it, without people, there is no business. People hold management positions. People do the work of the organization. People serve as customers. Business is all about people. His most famous contribution to management theory and practice is known as management by objectives. MBO, as it is known, is essentially a goal-setting exercise whereby the worker and the manager mutually agree upon goals for the worker. The worker's goals must be tied to the firm's goals. For example, if the firm has a goal of exceeding last year's sales by 10%, then probably most of the salespersons must have a goal of exceeding their own sales of last year by 10%. MBO requires the strict measurement of performance in relation to goals. Periodically, the worker and the manager meet to review progress towards the goal. And sometimes they have to adjust the goals upward or downward. But it's okay to reset the goals if needed. Therefore, MBO is an iterative process. That is, the overarching goal is carved up into smaller goals, and at each point of review, a new iteration of the goal may begin as a slightly adjusted goal 
based upon previous progress. Let's move on. Well, that's all for now. Thanks.